Thanks for staying, guys. Um, so today I'm really excited to um, talk to you about how the confluence of um, see this is working the confluence of um, computational science and biology is ushering in a new revolution, a biotechnology revolution that is going to have an impact on uh, the fashion industry and beyond. And I'd just like to read this out, especially for those who are um, following the live stream, because I think it's a really um, important lens through which to understand what's um, emerging around us. Uh, it's a quote from uh, Yuval Noah Harari uh, in his um, 2015 book, Homo Deus. And he says, you may not agree with the idea that organisms are algorithms, and that giraffes, tomatoes, and human beings are just different methods of processing data. But you should know that this is current scientific dogma, and that it is changing the world beyond recognition. Now, the discipline of synthetic biology, which is an emerging scientific um, discipline, is really uh, driven by this idea that you can start to program at a DNA level uh, novel functionalities um, in living systems, and it really takes engineering principles and applies them to biologies. How do you standardize parts so that you can assemble them to make things that nature would otherwise uh, not be able to make? Um, and it's a very interesting uh, discipline made up of, of lots of different uh, intellectual capacities. You have chemical engineers talking to molecular biologists, uh, systems biologists and biocatalysis, um, really working together to build the kinds of tools and platforms that make biology easier to engineer, with the hope that we have a wide application space, including high-value added chemicals, um, all sorts of um, different ways of making pharmaceuticals, biofuels, etc. Um, but as a designer, I said, so what happens when you add design into that category uh, of people working to build these technologies? Um, and just before I um, poo-poo on scientists, are there any scientists in the room? <laughs> Oh, hello, lovely to meet you. Um, so usually when designers work with scientists, um, it's a designer who's been brought in to do the science communication, the graphic design, tell the world what this is um, as succinctly as possible. Uh, but I'm of the view that actually um, quite amazing things can happen. If you put design upstream, how about you get a product designer working with an organism designer? What kinds of new platforms uh, can we start to build? What kinds of tools come to the fore? Um, and what happens to this application space? How does it expand? And it's, uh, for me, really this idea that uh, we're looking at the world around us and only seeing what's immediately around us and trying to replicate that. But when you start to have a diversity of intellect working to solve some of these problems, I think some pretty awesome things can happen. And so these are the um, questions that we're asking at Faber Futures, how do you integrate design thinking with uh, uh, fields like synthetic biology? And we do this through what is a part manifesto, evolving framework, um, that really starts to look at these key thematics, so on ecology, okay? So human beings have been designing predominantly for one species. What happens when we turn that around and say, we want to design for a multi-species agenda? How then do you approach an architectural brief if you're not just designing for human life? Cultures, how do we change mindsets inside the boardroom, outside the boardroom, uh, on the street? How do we change mindsets so that we can start to tackle some of these big problems in a collaborative way, so that we can build a uh, literacy around science, so that we can build a literacy around design. Um, materiality is a key area that we're exploring. What are some of the amazing material opportunities that exist when you begin to design with living systems? What new knowledges do we need to build um, from the bottom up to equip designers of the future to be able to be brilliant at this? And finally, frontiers. Um, how do we start to build plausible, preferable futures? Um, in my view, we do this by engaging with technologists to try and prototype some of these solutions. And so today, I'd like to walk you through um, materiality. And for us, materiality is this amazing opportunity to take biofabrication, design, biology, to make something uh, that is novel, something that is circular, something that is pollution-free, 
Um, and I really believe that biology is a, a, a space for us to explore this. And I think it's worth giving a little bit of context around how we're approaching materiality. And so um, in the frontier space, I want to use 2050 or Horizon 2050 to help us understand how uh, demographic shifts are putting pressure on the environment in the future. We're going to have to feed 10 billion people by 2050. We're also going to have to clothe them um, and shelter them. Where does that material capacity come from? Um, we also know that by 2050, textile production will require 300 million tons of non-renewable um, inputs, as I think Lucy touched on this earlier, um, and that in terms of where our material systems come from, they are tied to our ecology, so actually we do need to care about soil. Uh, 70 million trees are logged every year, turned into fabrics like rayon, viscose, and modal. And what's really fascinating is uh, the kind of culture that we have around consuming these resources is a throwaway culture. And so we're putting everything in landfill that we don't know how to process. All of these issues are interconnected. You can't solve one of them without speaking to the other. All of these issues are also built on extractivist um, uh, energy and material sources. And so divesting from fossil fuels, in my view, um, and turning to carbon um, and turning to uh, energy efficient uh, renewable uh, energy systems is, is, is amazing and we have to do that, but we also have to understand that uh, actually for oil producers the money is in the materials and we know what the materials are doing in landfill, we know what the materials are doing in our waste water, so we do have to divest from fossil fuel based materiality. Uh, and preferably to a system that can recycle and repurpose and replenish. And so where else do those solutions exist? They exist in nature. Nature can move and place atoms more quickly and precisely than any systems that human beings have ever produced, and they do this at scale. And so as a designer coming into this field of synthetic biology, there's a real question about how we start to amalgamate these thinking um, to build new material systems. And so I introduce you to the material rock stars of the future, algae, bacteria, fungi. Um, I don't have mammalian cells here, I should. They are definitely a part of this trio. Um, but really, the design of, with, and from biology or biodesign is where all of this starts to make sense. As an architect or trained architect and a materials designer, I'm interested in how fungi could produce new material systems for us. Uh, what kind of energy systems exist through algae? And can we start to work with bacteria to ferment our future? Um, and what does this fermentation process look like? We engineer a yeast potentially to produce new material systems that can be recycled, that can be replenishable within a circular system. Um, for me, that's great, but then we also need critical design thinking to make these technological interventions context-specific uh, and equitable. And so we've been working with a a microbe called Streptomyces coelicolor. You've all kind of interfaced it with it before. If you took a walk this morning, you probably smelt it. The smell of rain is caused by Streptomyces coelicolor. It emits a compound called geosmin. Uh, it's also used in, in, in scientific research for um, antibiotics. Uh, um, but Streptomyces coelicolor also produces a pigment. And it produces a pigment uh, in solid state fermentation uh, and in liquid fermentation. And if you add uh, textile to that mix, what you get is a microbe that is deploying dyes directly onto the textile. And it does this in a color fast way without using any chemicals, which is pretty incredible. Uh, and we're using up to 500 times less water to uh, direct ferment um, color or pigment onto textiles. And what's really fascinating about what, you st what starts to happen um, as a designer, as an innovator, as an engineer, when you design with a living system, is that you're actually producing innovative, mo not novel ways of, uh, of um, manufacturing. And so there's a real opportunity for innovative practice to happen with biofabrication. And so we've been developing different protocols that enable us to start to design from the bottom up different ways of arriving at beautiful aesthetic outcomes with microbes, which is difficult because they're invisible um, and difficult because sometimes you can't control nature, and that is a beautiful thing. Um, and so what are the constraints that 
as designers, we can start to understand about designing with living systems that are not a terrible thing, but actually an opportunity to ex expand our toolkit. We've been working um, to understand how fashion pattern cutting shifts once you have to dye something with bacteria in uh, a liquid dye bath, for example. And a lot of our protocols um, yield quite different results. We're trying to standardize them, we're trying to scale them, and you can see here that organic pattern is something that is, um, uh, that's one of our, um, our uh, key protocols. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful metaphor. Every single dot you see here is a colony uh, that lived and died over seven days. Um, and then we've been working to develop print, which is quite a challenge. How do you direct and control something that is alive, uh, you create the parameters for its growth. Uh, that needs new tools and that needs new fermentation processes. Um, how does the fabric respond in, in, in a wet environment over seven days? So these are some of the technical challenges that we are um, developing. And then uniformity, right? This is everyone's. Can you dye denim? Um, sure, we can dye denim, I guess, if that's your thing. Um, I'm interested in how you can start to reconsider what materials are because they're biologically driven. And so textures become very important. Uh, I, I always, um, I look at color and I, and I want to know what, what is the texture of that color because that's how Streptomyces dyes uniformity. It always does it uniformly, but there is this beautiful um, three-dimensionality to um, the effect of introducing that microbe to that, to that um, fabric. And so we've been working um, to scale those small little Petri dishes those little tests into always looking to, to build something a little bit larger. Um, and I said earlier, you know, pattern cutting to make garments, um, but understanding the materiality of your original source material, so how you dye an organza is going to be fundamentally different to a habitat, and therefore what can you make when you say you want to dye um, something with a, a mirrored print, for example. And we've also been scaling um, the amount of fabric that we dye, and so five meters, I think, is our uh, longest piece of fabric we can dye, and there are very specific things you can do with that, and there are some things you just fundamentally can't do with that. And so we're trying to figure out all of the different strategies to be able to make at scale beautiful artifacts um, with Streptomyces silicolum. So very quickly, before I finish, uh, a little bit of trivia. Can anyone um, spot the organism? Uh, with, with any of these. I've already told you about mine, so we can skip that. But um, anyone, anyone have any ideas? Okay. So this is Bolt Threads. They've been um, engineering a yeast that produces spider silk. Uh, they've collaborated with Stella McCartney, which I think she'll talk about a little bit more later on today. Um, Ecovative and the living for MoMA PSI built an architectural pavilion using mycelium. Or, or mushroom roots, the bit that we don't eat. Uh, and this is uh, an amazing uh, moment to reconsider how we might grow our architecture and what are the implications of us having to grow our architecture? How do we um, shrink and expand uh, according to our resource needs? Um, and what are the amazing new structures we can build because we're growing something instead of um, pouring it or molding it? Speaking of pouring, Modern Meadow um, have done something quite brilliant. They've engineered a yeast to produce collagen, which makes sense um, uh, for cosmetics, but what about textiles? Um, in textiles, that means you've produced a liquid leather, and so they can pour their leather. And that is just mind-blowing, because suddenly, what we thought leather could do, uh, it can do more, um, which is really an amazing feat. But all of these um, interventions are also working through this lens. They are also considering what are the ecological impacts of these new ways of growing, of making, of cultivating materials. Um, what are the kind of cultural shifts that need to happen at an organizational level? How do we get scientists to talk to designers and designers to spe speak to science on equal terms so that we can move forwards? Um, on materiality, of course, they're expanding our material uh, library, our, our design vocabulary, uh, to, be, to be honest, um, based on uh, how fundamentally different these processes are from what we've known. Um, and they are mapping out the future of fashion, um, which is, for me, uh, an amazing opportunity to think about new models. If we're saying that the system is broken, how do we prototype that future and who needs to be at that table. And so 
I um, finish with uh, the, the rest of Yuval's sentence. He says, not only individual organisms are seen today as data processing systems, but also entire societies, such as beehives, bacteria, colonies, forests, and human cities. And this, to me, is the, the bit that I'm not going to talk about today, but the bit that says convergence is upon us, and so AI, biology, design, philosophy, poetry, all of these things are going to turn into one cacophony of hopefully um, ecological um, plenty. And so I will leave you with uh, a question around what you think design can do, given what you do in the field of synthetic biology. Thank you. Thank you.